I just want to say, um, uh, I suppose, hello to everyone joining in today. We have people coming from different parts of, of the globe. So whether it's good morning or good afternoon or whatever part of the day, welcome. This is, um, I suppose, uh, an episode in the Disruptive Technology series. Um, it is uh, led by Digital Transformation Lab. Um, my own name is Paddy O'Reilly and my co-host here today is Tony Moroni. Both of us are uh, on the uh, committee of the Digital Transformation Lab. It being really a, a think tank that operates out of the Cork University Business School here in Ireland. Um, so uh, I suppose without further ado, really, we're absolutely delighted to have Dr. Ingrid uh, Vasiliu Feltes with us today. Um, in a way, Ingrid needs no introduction. Uh, I think anyone that sort of follows, um, I suppose, discussions about whether it's AI, machine learning, metaverse, omniverse on social media will come across Ingrid and her contributions. But look, I'm not going to do Ingrid justification in trying to explain who Ingrid is, so I'm going to allow Ingrid to introduce herself. Welcome, Ingrid. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me. It's a great uh, pleasure to be with you. I admire both of your work and uh, we've been uh, following each other closely in this uh, exciting digital era and unfortunately uh, we are witnessing also some uh, very sad times for society but today we'll try to focus on on the digital era. Um, I wear multiple hats. Uh, all of them are at the intersection of science, technology, entrepreneurship and an area that's very near and dear to my heart, which is digital ethics. So uh, I have the privilege uh, to be the CEO of a deep tech uh, technology company and uh, also to volunteer for several international organizations that are all, um, as I mentioned, dedicated towards either digital advocacy, sustainability, deploying uh, blockchain technologies or uh, collaborating with other groups on deploying other emerging on frontier technologies such as uh, quantum or nanotechnology or AI. Uh, I also have the opportunity to collaborate with uh, several United Nations affiliated organizations where we work together to either help uh, entrepreneurs around the world gain access to funding or we work uh, to promote uh, women in AI or we work on uh, promoting digital health. So a variety of activities. And that's how I came across uh, the metaverse and the omniverse. And as we know, there has been a lot of uh, activity in this domain. So we thought today it would be exciting for us to have a conversation about what they actually mean and how they impact uh, our society in all domains, uh, how we live, how we work, how we um, educate and so forth. Thank you. Yeah, so e even your introduction, uh, Ingrid, is fantastic because it gives us plenty of launch pads for lots of really important discussions. And I, and I also, I suppose, um, maybe uh, agree with you that you know, it's difficult times here in Europe at, at the moment, and it's important maybe to recognize that as well. But look, we're, we're, there's also, I suppose, um, uh, a world hopefully beyond what's happening at the moment, and maybe the omniverse, metaverse will be part of that future world. So I'm gonna hand over to Tony. I'm sure Tony, uh, over the week, we've been gathering lots of, of uh, insights, questions from our own community, and I'm sure there's plenty of questions, Tony, that we can, we can um, field to Ingrid. Yeah, absolutely, Polly. Ingrid, great to see you again. Um, we might as well get straight into it. And I know you wrote an article there recently in terms of you know preparing businesses for the metaverse and omniverse era. But look, you know, Web3, omniverse, metaverse, the, you know, all these terms are out there and people are struggling to actually understand what we mean by them. So maybe that's, that's first principles. You know, what, what's your definition of these areas? Well, first, I'm glad you mentioned my definition. I would like to start by saying that if we look at the technology publications, so scientific journals published by technology groups, you'll find a very technical definition that's very hard to digest uh, most of the time. Uh, if you look at business industry leaders, how they define it is yet an another facet, right? And that is more uh, amenable to, to describe our daily life and uh, using terms that we're accustomed to in our daily lives. So I'm going to try to, to give us a hybrid for today, if, if I may. So first of all, it's essential to separate Web 3.0 
from metaverse and omniverse in terms of definitions. And I would also like to highlight that it's important not to confuse the omniverse with the multiverse, which is yet another element. And uh, so I've been asked that before. Um, so hopefully we'll, after today, clarify for most of our audience what they mean. So let's start with the simple part uh, in quotes, that would be the metaverse. In, in a way that I like to describe it simply is, is like a symbiotic relationship between what we know now as the internet with it, the latest generation of, of gadgets, then social media engagement platform, all novel emerging technologies combined that allow us to interact in a hyperspatial temporal way. That's like the simplest version we can give. Um, and more than that, it aims to replicate what we do in our daily lives, but in a 3D environment. So the same way we like to shop in daily life, the same way we like to work in daily life, the way we like to play and entertain ourselves in daily life, you have a digital replica in 3D of all those activities. That's the, the purpose of the metaverse. Now, of course, it's not fully developed yet. And that's uh, still uh, what we're aiming to, to see how it's going to pan out. Um, the omniverse is a, is a different uh, connotation and a little bit more complex. Uh, that one, what I would like to emphasize also is there is no technical full definition, but uh, the industry leaders, I, I found one that I like very much for omniverse and that's uh, by the CEO of NVIDIA. And his definition was that uh, it's a universe that is spatial temporally four dimensional and that it combines multi-graphic processing units real time with 3D simulation and design collaboration. So again, tough to, to handle all those terms, but um, again, if we simplify it, it's a four dimensional replica of what we aim to do as opposed to three dimensional to keep it uh, as simple as possible for our audience. I have also noticed that there is a tendency for large scale enterprises to, to work more towards omniverse and then the metaverse to be more for B2C and just general uh, audience engagement. If we also look at the organizations that have been promoting and, and uh, developing meta experiences versus omni experiences, there's a clear separation. And when we talk today about use cases, we'll see that also the use cases for meta are, are a little bit different than the omni use cases. So that's a, I know it was a long answer, but yeah, I hope that helps a little. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and Web.3 then, or Web 3.0 on top of all that, because you know there are discussions going around and these are used in the same sentence. So is there a difference? And if there is, what is the difference? So again, to keep it simple, many people use them interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. Uh, Web 3.0 is the what we call the next generation iteration of the internet. So it's the back end, if you will, the meta and omniverse, what we described so far is the experience and the interaction with the users versus the Web 3.0 is the next generation of internet. And we evolved over the last 50 years from Web 1.0, which was very unidimensional, right? then web 2.0 which allowed us to interact and click and do things and now we're going to be web 3.0 which is 3d and like we mentioned it will encompass all existing technologies as well as these emerging technologies and I'll allow a unique convergence of not only all the elements we were accustomed to but also augmented reality virtual reality extended reality ai 3d holograms everything that we have um, been able to um, deploy so far, but all in a convergent way. So now the features for Web 3.0, we have to emphasize, it completely changes the paradigm from what we were accustomed to in Web 1.0 and Web 2.0. And the main features there that we have to emphasize to our audience are the decentralization, the trustless factor, right? Um, and we're going to touch a little bit more about them. So it's, it's important to, to really emphasize the fact that it's not only new technology, but a, a totally different way, the way it will be managed and organized. So it's not just a, a, a conglomerate of new technologies, the structure and ownership and the permissions that will be 
allowed in this new um, format of what we call Web 3.0 are going to be a change in paradigm and, and impact a lot of uh, facets in our society. Fascinating. Yeah. And, and Tony, just to come in there, like I think there's maybe even this week alone, uh, Ingrid, coming up to this event, it was interesting to hear people talking about, you know, the way they're seeing, let's say, the, the metaverse, the omniverse, but maybe one concern, and, and it ties back to, your, you mentioned NVIDIA there a while ago, and NVIDIA has a solution or an offering called the omniverse. And I think there's an early perception uh, and a fear among some that will this be owned? Will the metaverse, the omniverse, or metaverses and omniverses be owned by some companies that people may fear in some ways, you know, uh, especially when it comes to uh, ethics, regulation, etc. Absolutely. Well, that's one of the articles I also wrote in addition to the business models one that we must be very careful how we deploy all these technologies, but specifically the metaverse and omniverse are highly amenable to cyber threats and there are so many ethical conundrums that we'll have to manage. But in theory, it should be a decentralized format that should allow consumers to, to have ownership. It should be better. But again, yes, it, <laughs> uh, the proof is in the details how it will be deployed. And uh, we hope that all the organizations will, will collaborate and truly uh, promote uh, a decentralized democratizing kind of uh, model for I suppose, I suppose though, Ingrid, though, e even if it is decentralized, um, in this immersive world, people will know even more about you. Uh, and you know, one of the big questions that we've had, and certainly there's discussions going on in governments all over the world in terms of you know, yeah. technology and data and data privacy, is this going to bring us into a whole new you know, realm of possibilities and problems? Absolutely. I think the, the opportunities uh, are almost equal to the problems that, that we're facing. And I've been a big advocate to have proactive ethics programs and proactive cybersecurity programs, what we call by design, that allow us to embed all these safeguards and guardrails at every single step. Because what we've seen traditionally is that people rush to deploy technologies and say, we'll deal with the problems later. And unfortunately, then they become insurmountable. And a big one that is highly related to ethics and to uh, security is portability and interoperability. If we don't do those right, that's where breaches occur, right? Because we keep adding technologies, we keep trying to, to embed all these novel experiences with legacy systems, and that's where we have breakthroughs uh, because no one thought about them in time. So I would like to emphasize that, yes, only by being proactive and planning these carefully and having multidisciplinary teams of experts working on it in a thoughtful, proactive way, we can um, do it right. As a matter of fact, this morning I saw the news that finally the US and European Union are coming closer to solve the 20 years conundrum of GDPR and HIPAA. <laughs> so imagine if we had uh, trouble uh, solving those for so many years, how it's going to be to uh, solve all the complex data management and privacy management issues that will be in a hyper globalized environment, such as the, the two that we are discussing now, which are the metaverse and the omniverse. So a lot of issues, but I think definitely digital identity, we, you touched on it briefly, but I think it's an important element. If we educate the consumers what digital identity means, and if we give them the tools uh, at the right time, not too late to understand how all this can impact them, I think it will help a lot. And um, I've had the opportunity to work with several colleagues internationally. I think if we change the, the model and start having a decentralized um, application early on in all the facets of society, such as education, finance, the way we even onboard people for work, the way we get our certifications for, for school or work, I think then we start to have a, a critical mass that can help in, in changing the paradigm for, for both the metaverse and omniverse. Yeah, one, one thing that strikes me though, uh, Ingrid, is that 
you know, I think Cap Gemini did a big, big piece of work in terms of, you know, where firms embedding your know, ethics in at mm -hmm. the outset, whether it's AI or whatever else. Uh, and a lot of the times they found actually, no, they weren't because either, you know, they hadn't time or they hadn't budget or they hadn't whatever. Uh, and then to your point, what they're then trying to do is fix this after the event. And the problem with technology is, well, it becomes a very scalable event. So, you know, do boards and executives in your mind or to your mind, have they really got their arms around the fact that, look, these new technologies create the opportunities, but they also create huge potential areas for detriment. And do you think boards and executives really understand this? I wish I could answer a yes, but it's actually not all uh, or not sufficient. <laughs> we, we've had the opportunity with several colleagues to, to talk with numerous boards. And unfortunately, there's still a perception. It's, it's not that someone says, I don't care about ethics. It's not that. But yes, they don't understand the true threats. They think that just having a, a simple cybersecurity a software system in place is enough. And that's not true because we know that data breaches have increased several hundredfold over the last 18 months. And they also, you mentioned budget. Do you know the average cost of a data breach in 2021 as per the recent publications? $9 million per data breach, 9 million. Yet when you ask them to maybe pay $150,000 for a proactive ethics program or a pro ethics cybersecurity program, they say it's too expensive. So. I think there's still a perception that insurance can take care of it. If we have a data breach, we'll deal with it after. The same way a little bit how we deal with legal problems or with penalties for audits. And I think that's completely not helpful to think about it like that because then you always let the breach happen and you have to just mitigate. And that's gonna cause catastrophic consequences, particularly in this metaverse and omniverse environment. So proactive ethics by design, proactive cybersecurity and embedding it at every single step. And I would add creating a culture of ethics and the culture of cyber resilience in the organizations is essential because just deploying something and then forgetting about it doesn't work. So I always say, uh, like digital transformation, it's a journey, right? Ethics is not a one-time thing and cybersecurity is not a one-time thing. No matter how amazing you did it, you have to engage in continuous improvement and continuous evolving threats need to be embedded into whatever program you, you have in place. And I, I think it's, that it's an interesting point, uh, Ingrid, because I don't think uh, especially technology companies have a, a good track record when it comes to ethics. I don't even know, I don't even think they know what ethics is or how to do it in a in a sort of in a robust way. Uh, so, so hence, we also need regulators. Uh, and, uh, and I'm not sure the regulators know what to do in this space either. It's it's a really confusing uh, space. Uh, and I know maybe a discussion we had during the week is to know if we uh, in, were like to invest more and more of our time in, in uh, let's say, the likes of the metaverse in, in virtual realities. Um, uh, and if someone controls that virtual reality, then they may control the discussion, the information available within it. And you've the whole issue then of misinformation, even uh, as a more acute problem than it is at the, at the moment. You're absolutely right. What I've noticed that unfortunately, sometimes yes, ethics is misunderstood. When we use other terms such as, do you care about privacy? Then people are much more amenable to listen because they don't always relate. Or do you care about bias? Do you care about discrimination? Do you care about fairness in, in all the technologies that we deploy? Do you care about transparency, explainability? Then you sometimes get people's attention at all levels. But even there, I think very often we hear that, well, can't I just get a software to take care of this? And I think that's the part we're trying to say, we have to change the way we approach this. It cannot just be, just get another software on top of the 50 softwares to see if the 50 softwares are doing what they're supposed to do. That's not gonna work. You have to have a, a much more comprehensive approach in the way we think about this. And digital literacy and ethical literacy for the digital era I think are going to be very important. 
And I can see here, Tony, um, mm. uh, one of our guests just wanting to make it a bit real, you know, Eugene, yeah. uh, welcome Eugene. So Eugene is saying, look, uh, is there any genuine research to show that people actually want this thing called the metaverse? Or is it all sort of supply side driven, in, driven by uh, large investments in, in, in the likes of technology companies? Eugene saying that really the likes of Second Life uh, never really achieved mass adoption. What's going to be different about uh, the web 3.0, the metaverse? I, I absolutely love that question. I totally agree because I was reflecting with a friend just a few days ago that we see, I think, a, a split. We have part of society that's been very immersed in this space for many years and they go, oh, now finally everybody else is talking about it, such as the gaming industry or entertainment industry, right? They're much more accustomed to this. But then the rest, I agree, that it was almost an overnight push from industry to, to make this a, a trend, right? And you had a rush over a matter of four to six weeks of large companies promoting it and, and making investments in it. If you look at just uh, maybe six months ago, eight months ago, there was no one talking about it except maybe very rarely in, in a gaming uh, space. So I agree with Eugene, there is, a push, and I would associate it a little bit with, um, let's use the iPhone as an example. If you ask people before the iPhone, do you want an iPhone? They would have answered, I don't know, my phone works just fine, the one I'm using right now, right? The flip phone. And then now, what do we see? Everybody wants the next generation iPhone, even when the, their other one still works very well. So I think we see a little bit of that, of industry pushing and people rushing to not miss out, right? I, I have noticed a little bit some of that, that everybody's worried, well, what if we're too late in the game and what do we need to do to, to keep in tune with what's happening? Because otherwise we might not be part of this digital transformation that we're observing. I mean, Greg, can you, can, I suppose when you look at it, you can say, on one hand, look, there's the technology companies. So, you know, there's Meta, there's Microsoft, there's NVIDIA. But on the other hand, what we're seeing is, you know, the, the, all these sort of consumer brands, Nike, you name it, JP Morgan, even someone's put in there, JP yes. Morgan, and I, I saw they had opened a branch, of consulting course. firms opening branches in the metaverse, people buying land, open embassies, all that sort of stuff. So yes, there's a technology side, but what, what's driving the other side of it then where you have companies who are clearly looking to the future uh, and you know, what, what's driving the thinking from the, the, the type of conversations you're having? Well, it, it seems that, uh, and there was a great article about that in Forbes too, that people realized very quickly that it's a new form of marketing. Uh, so before we had just normal digital marketing, I think now people realize that your virtual presence in the metaverse or omniverse is a must from a marketing perspective. And they also realize that there are opportunities in terms of the way we educate, the way we work, particularly with the push towards remote work, um, I think everybody is, is striving to find ways to re-engage uh, workers and re-engage their employees. And I think that's why you see all the facets uh, in society from finance, from education, healthcare even, we haven't even talked about it, right? And, and um, even the real estate industry has been massively pushing towards this because they realize the potential. And I think people want to secure the, the turf, so to speak. I recall when we had URLs at the beginning, um, there, there was a similar rush and people saying, why would you buy a URL? Well, now people that own domains are doing very well in the internet, right? So I think it's a, a little bit of the same people wanna secure their, uh, their space in this new uh, ecosystem. And then if it takes off, great. If not, at least they didn't miss out. But absolutely, we see that, um, from a business transformation perspective, everybody realizes that you must understand this new space and be versatile in it. Yeah, and, and Ingrid, is it that these companies are thinking about the consumer that's there today, or is it that they're thinking about the consumer that's coming through tomorrow? Uh, like absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's the other big uh, divide we see. It's clear that Meta went for a specific age group that's in the, 10, 12 years old that are going to grow up over the next few years in this space. And then I think, yes, you see the other um, 
section, more of omniverse like that's going towards how can we capture the market that's now in the business ecosystem and that's doing business in, in this realm. But absolutely, they're they're aiming to capture the generations that that come and prepare for the next 10, 15 years. And and yeah, on that that's actually uh, I'm intrigued because there's the the I suppose back well over a decade ago when people were looking at second life, you know, and this idea of a second reality. What we realized was people in the second, when they were in the second reality, were not the same person as they were in physical reality. So in a way, uh, Tony, I'm intrigued by the idea that we're actually not designing for the people in the physical reality. We, we might also be designed for people as they wish to be in a virtual reality. And we can see people changing genders when they go from the physical yeah. reality to the virtual reality, changing all sorts of aspects of their life, becoming something different. And I'm just, I'm intrigued by that Ingrid, and I'm not sure if you've any, any views on it. Well, I actually have a friend when we discussed this uh, about a month ago, who said that we might see omni-gender soon uh, or, or meta-gender and you just mentioned it. So, I, I think it opens up a whole uh, other discussion in terms of um, the digital identity that I mentioned to also touch on other facets of um, how do you want to be seen? Yes, what is your persona in your personal versus work life versus in your education space? Um, the avatars that we see that people choose, right? How, how can that contribute to the larger discussion about diversity, inclusion and and other elements that are so important to avoid discrimination in the hiring process, for example, or to give everybody equal opportunity in terms of um, access to finance or access to education or access to specific jobs. So I think definitely there are multiple uh, components to that and, and we see a strong uh, push in, in that regard as well, that uh, there are companies who have understood that. But to go back to, to Tony's point as well, there we haven't touched yet on the fact that there's a large amount of dollars globally, right? $3 trillion captured by this new digital economy. So I think that's another reason why the metaverse and omniverse will, will have an opportunity to allow also maybe unlocking some of those trap dollars that are currently in, in digital currencies to to be utilized in some fashion. And by creating this whole other ecosystem around, you create the marketplace for those to be unlocked because right now they're locked. So I think by doing that, we might also see the other parallel push, which we've seen from banks and large financial institutions to accommodate to other forms of currency, not just fiat currency. Yeah, and just one other point you know and again during the week I was hearing people refer to articles the articles were talking about how we're going to live in the metaverse how we're going to work uh, in the metaverse is that actually where do you sit in terms of this Ingrid are we likely to spend lots of our time living now in in, uh, in virtual worlds uh, work in virtual worlds rather than um, physical worlds per, per se well, I think we've also seen tiny, tiny movements towards that with the remote uh, work environments, right? You already have Microsoft Teams offering a virtual reality um, session, and we have also seen uh, Spatial I.O. offering all kinds of environments. So you could perceive that the generation that's growing up now or that's entering the workforce now would love a virtual workspace. So the same way we used to go to work traditionally <laughs> to a physical space, now you'll just go to the virtual workspace and uh, you'll have a totally different uh, persona there and you'll travel to a virtual city. But uh, I, I think definitely there are many who have absolutely no problem envisioning a future like that. And then there are others who think it's uh, akin to science fiction. Yeah, and I think, I think there's a point in there from Repkin uh, and he talks about, you know, training and training of doctors and whatnot. Uh, and I know he's written a lot about this subject himself. But when you think about it, like, you know, it, you know some, some subjects that you might want to learn or study, they can be hard to grasp. But in this world, they become very real. So maybe give us a thoughts on that, because I know this is an area you're passionate about anyway. Absolutely. So, yes, smart health, digital twins in healthcare have been a passion of mine and I totally agree for healthcare and, and other industries such as uh, nuclear industry that have high risk. You can do a lot of good to train people in a safe way 
And yes, for healthcare, we have generations of doctors and I wish I would go back to medical school now with the tools we have, honestly, because for us, it was torture. We had 3000 page anatomy books in black and white and had to draw by hand, but absolutely healthcare and life sciences have huge um, application for this space for the good reasons, meaning you could train students, you could train doctors in new procedures. You can also educate patients about complex procedures. You can have multi uh, teams of multidisciplinary um, uh, specialists collaborate in this virtual space and exchange ideas or even collaborate for the same surgery. So we actually have already examples of uh, hospitals of the future. Japan is a forerunner in this, but many others have, have made huge strides. We have a few great startups that are deploying uh, AR and VR for healthcare. And I can only emphasize that if deployed appropriately, particularly for safety reasons and collaboration amongst the uh, physicians, you can do a lot of good. Uh, also, I, I think for pharmaceutical safety, we have seen tremendous applications for medical devices, biotech devices, uh, patients in, in remote areas that otherwise would never have the chance to, to have the appropriate treatment. So the possibilities are endless for smart health of the future if we use the metaverse and the omniverse uh, appropriately. The other one that we don't often talk a lot, but I've seen lately an increase in interest is mental health. So there are a lot of people who see potential of using uh, the metaverse and omniverse for mental health. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm curious to see how that's gonna work out. Already VR has been successfully deployed for patients that had trauma from war and for patients in cancer and for children that have all kinds of uh, chronic diseases and having that immersive experience in a, in a pleasurable environment that's appropriate can have, help a lot with pain and help recuperate. It's also been used for elderly and disabled. So we can go on and on. But again, the whole point is to deploy it mindfully and ethically and uh, with all the teams like we talked at the beginning of our session, multidisciplinary teams and, and safeguard, of course, these vulnerable populations. Yeah, and and uh, and of course, like even in Industry 4.0, Ingrid, we're already seeing digital twins in operation. You know, where people are working on uh, a digital twin of of a production plant in in a very safe way, are, are able to learn about a production plant through a digital twin. So I think that's so. Again, it's a point well made that we're seeing really uh, elements of the metaverse possibly already in, in, in action in some spaces. And I love your example also uh, from, from healthcare. Um, just one, one comment I received during the week as well, Ingrid, was um, again, uh, I suppose, um, some of these technologies tend to be very addictive. You know, the, the experience that we might get in the digital world could be far in excess of what a lot of us might experience in our real world. And we start spending more and more time being sucked into these digital worlds and then maybe spending less time uh, enjoying our physical world, but also maybe worrying about things like climate change, et cetera, because we're so besotted and engrossed in this virtual world. Any comments on that? Oh, uh, quite a lot, because as a physician, I worry that, yes, it impacts also our, our health and wellness. We don't move. There are many kids who have never played in a park ever. They're just eight to 12 hours a day in front of a computer screen or babies these days. You see how their parents just put a little device in front of them and they're very entertained. But I worry what's going to happen in terms of social interactions, ability to respond to human emotion ability to to have a healthy lifestyle in terms of exercise nutrition i mean there are all kinds of components but absolutely to your comment about the environment i i think that's a double edged sword because i think if we use the metaverse and omniverse widely and appropriately we can actually help uh, some of the sustainability efforts and and eco um consciousness that we all strive for so it depends though how uh, we build these environments. If all the metaverse will be encouraging young kids to take care of the environment and all the games they play would be focused on sustainability and inclusion and, uh, and pick one United Nations sustainable goal and have each video game geared toward that. I wonder how this generation would grow up. So you can do a lot of good to it. Just matters how we're going to use it. If all you do is shop, 
and all you do is just play games that are causing harm, then I don't think it's going to turn out well. I have to be honest. Really interesting point. And a question for Ingrid. You know, I, I've seen in different industries that the type of digital dexterity skills that these teenagers are developing through online gaming and everything else, I mean, that will ultimately put them at a big advantage in terms of jobs of the future, which will be in this kind of you know, virtual digital world we're heading. Oh, absolutely. And there are actually very interesting imaging studies that show that uh, children that have spent more than a specific amount of hours and the hours vary. That's not important now for our conversation, but it can reshape the brain structure. And yes, these kids grow up with a new type of intelligence that we never had before because their, their senses are being stimulated simultaneously in a way that humans were not wired before to be stimulated, right? We used to just use a pen or just use our eyes or the ears. Now you have an immersive environment where you have to use five senses at the same time. And, and uh, we have imaging studies that show that it truly changes. And yes, everybody that grew up has a new set skills that we will probably never uh, achieve at, at that level. So it will reshape the workforce. Um, those of us that did not have it will have to learn a lot <laughs> and adapt. So upskill or reskill to, to make it in this environment. Yeah, and, and I see here, just to go back to the, um, the chat again, uh, Ingrid, to know that Josh here is talking about um, something again, I've heard lots of people talking about that is, is the availability of effect of headsets, uh, sort of uh, an impediment yeah. to actually the adoption for the moment, especially maybe the weight on the head, etc. But also, I think there's a lot now also talking about that we're probably moving to a brain uh, from, a, from that to brain to machine interface. And we're seeing maybe again in head Healthcare, where we're starting to use these interfaces for controlling Parkinson's, our movements, etc. Where are we going in terms of these, you know, the, the necessities, the things we must have, such as headsets or brain interfaces, whatever, for, 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 for uh, I suppose, the next five, 10 years? Uh, thank you, Josh, for that question. It's a great question. I'm actually writing a chapter for a book now on how um, human computer interfaces will, will reshape uh, intelligence and the way we interact, but absolutely. So there are three questions there. The first one is the headsets. I think Elon Musk also said, who's going to walk around with this big scuba diving things now every day? So they're yet not uh, amenable for large scale adoption. But I've seen models, I'm sure all of us have seen the ones just like you're wearing, maybe now uh, very, very elegant models that will be uh, easy to wear. We also have seen uh, lenses, just contact lenses that already have the same functionality. Now the cost is not yet at a, at a price point that everybody could afford widely, but I think in a few years we'll see it. So yes, there are strides in the entrepreneurship ecosystem. Everybody's pushing very hard to make them much more easy to wear. The second point you mentioned is how do you interact in this environment, right? That that's this other ecosystem with your real physical environment and how do you transition? So to take healthcare, right? You might need these to help you with your interaction with patients and in an operating room, for example, but then making that transition back is, is you need a certain versatility to be able to handle that. Not everybody has those skills. I would use the analogy like we see in fighter pilots. Not all of us have the skills to be a fighter pilot and have that type of reaction time and absorb so much information and make decisions very quickly. But there are certain specialties and certain domains, such as healthcare or nuclear sciences or space technology, where those will come in very hand. Um, the last one that you mentioned, the last point is that um, definitely I see an opportunity also for education. So if we have early education where this will be embedded appropriately, I think we can help uh, do it right. And when I say right is with the impact on health, with, with keeping a right balance between the physical world, human interaction and the, the computer input. Because otherwise, if we think about uh, now um, human and computer interfaces, it becomes very challenging because we don't know yet how it's gonna impact the brain. And um, that's one important point in, in terms of the question. 
yes, it sounds fascinating to have neural link devices, right? Where we could have just IoT immediately uh, linked to our brain. We could have a voice command that tells our brain already to start everything and not even have to wear glasses. But I wonder how are we gonna uh, understand what it uh, does on the rest of, of the brain? And we have examples from um, cell phones, right? At the beginning, people were ambiguous if it's gonna cause any harm. Well, we have now tests of, and studies after years that cancers have increased because of constant, even these devices we're wearing now to hear uh, long-term could, could cause some damage. But I, I echo the concerns of our audience that we must be careful. These human brain interfaces can do a lot of damage as well, but they have true potential. So I think balance, like with everything, no extremes, just using the mindfully where appropriate and with good use, I think it, it has huge potential, uh, such as ki kids or other adults with disabilities. I've seen great applications of some of these devices for kids with dyslexia or blindness or deafness. They can do amazing and they change their life, but that's different than having everybody use it just for fun, right? Hours in a row. Hope that helped a little bit. I know it's a big topic. But... Yeah, and it ties in then with this whole idea of augmented intelligence. And I know you write about hybrid intelligence as well, uh, Ingrid, which I know hopefully is maybe a discussion for another day because I think it's really fascinating. What happens when, when humans, machine, and virtual worlds come together? And that's something I suppose we're going to see play out over the next uh, number of years. So uh, another question here from Rosemary. So Rosemary's uh, saying, um, you know, also maybe we shouldn't forget about the power of, of being able to suspend uh, uh, disbelief or suspend belief maybe as well, you know, in terms of, of the, the metaverse. Um, and that sometimes that, you know, this uh, suspension is, is relegated to something we do through gaming, et cetera, entertainment, but maybe there's a, a bigger uh, role for it, maybe in, again, mental health, et cetera. Um, so Eugene, uh, would it be uh, fair or, or more fair for, uh, uh, to focus on, uh, to appreciate the differences between enterprise commercial and consumer adoption? And that's a question. Yes, I, I absolutely think so. And I think that's what we see clearly in the, the types of uh, companies that have pushed for one or the other. I think they clearly go either to direct to consumer or uh, enterprise level. And I think it, it matters a lot because the type of uh, technologies that you deploy are a little bit different. Uh, the use cases are totally different. The type of interoperability you need and the type of safeguards you need are very different. So, for instance, using it for smart healthcare as an example, you'll definitely need the omniverse, right? If I just use for fashion, you might do fine with a metaverse appliance. So, I think we'll see the same um, trends like we've seen with other emerging technologies that there will be a differentiation for who wants to capture this um, community that's just interested in entertainment, fashion. Uh, new experiences, real estate versus those that want to use it to completely transform the way they build things, uh, do business, the way they design things. I mean, we haven't even talked about the potentials for architecture, for um, other industries that are not so uh, like life sciences, as an example, pharmaceutical development, right? There are huge potentials in, in all those. And uh, like you mentioned already, uh, several industrial spaces have been successful in, in doing this. Ingrid, talk to us a little bit about ownership. So we hear about people buying land, buying art, you know, using NFTs, cryptocurrencies. How does all that fit into this? Well, I think that's, like we mentioned briefly, digital currencies, digital assets, crypto assets are probably a big, subtle marketing drive in this and business driver because I, I, I know that uh, most of our audience probably is aware that uh, obscene amounts of, of dollars have been poured into NFTs, right? And uh, that yes, there are people who are, are paying um, in the millions for real estate. And, and I think it's the same trend we've seen for the past uh, 20 years when new technologies and new opportunities arise. There are some early movers who take a risk but if all of this becomes reality and you can own first in the metaverse and then that translates into the real physical space, then 
it works out really well because you secure the space that now was very cheap and later on it's going to be worth way more. Uh, I think we see the same with space right now. People are buying airspace in space, right? And most people say, why would you do that? Or for uh, flying uh, cars, right? People are already buying the, the future um, space in, in for uh, cars that will fly. So I, I think it, it sounds uh, scary to some of us that are not accustomed to this, but I think that trend is going to continue and there will be a time where we'll have that convergence and there will be an equivalence of uh, the same way we've seen with cryptocurrency and fiat currency. We might see the same thing that titles obtained in the metaverse and omniverse, maybe not direct conversion, most likely not, but there will be at one point maybe some equivalence. Yeah, could there be a crash in the metaverse, <laughs> a financial crash? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, no. So it, I, I, it is interesting because you know if if you think about the and look, it's probably alien to most of us the idea of buying an NFT in the metaverse or a piece of land. It's not something most of us have done in the past, but yet it is happening around us. Uh, and the question is, where where does it all go? Exactly. Well, but on the positive side, so let's not just think negative, right? If you think about NFTs are unique digital collectibles, let's call it simple now. Humanity has collected things for as long as we can remember. The thing is, there are a lot of use cases for the digital collectibles, right? And these are unique digital collectibles. So I think the trend will continue. Um, I also have observed that um, it depends how you how you think about it. If you want to take the positive side of it, you could use these um, digital collectibles also for only positive things, such as education, right? What if we use NFTs for our education certificates, for educational credits, for tracking tuition remission uh, elements so that you don't have? What if we use them to not have fraud, waste, and abuse? What if we use them for all kinds of other good things such as sustainable development goals? I mean, you can, it depends what we do with this tool. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, if we use it only for things that are not always helpful, then we're gonna have negative consequences. But if we use this collective creativity and uh, interest and enthusiasm towards good things, I think they have a lot of uh, good use. And that's why I always am, uh, emphasizing that it's important for every new technology, it can do equal good and bad. It's all up to us how we work together to just push it towards more good. You can never avoid malicious intent completely, but we can certainly all push towards that. So I hope that the bright minds in the world will collaborate and when we work in this digital economy, we'll use some of these digital um, novel tools also for the good of society, not just for the bad things. Yeah, and I, and I see here, sort of on that same idea, you know, um, uh, Ingrid Audrey has a comment here, though, about the dangers also of the neural link devices overriding personal autonomy, etc. There's also a lot of um, maybe talk about, you know, the move towards haptic devices, haptic vests, etc., where uh, you, what you then do is physically experience someone's touch in a virtual world, but then there's the whole idea of inappropriate touching, etc. Exactly. And I know there's a lot of issues there. And any any uh, comments on that, Ingrid? Because it's a whole new world that a lot of us have not even considered. That something now in the virtual world <laughs> can nearly play out in our in the real world. And again, how far can legislation or uh, reach, you know, in terms of preventing these things? Absolutely, I think boundaries, physical space boundaries and our body awareness will have a whole new connotation in, in this new environment and, and um, haptic gloves or haptic vests or all kinds of other haptic experiences uh, for the full body, which we might experience soon, will change the way we have to set guardrails. I also um, wanna echo the concern that our um, um, audience has expressed about cyber neural hacking because it exposes us to whole new levels of, of invasion to our privacy that we never even conceptualized before. And if we don't intervene early, we can have 
very um, negative consequences also on the mental health of people because when you start to have neuro hacking it's not just paying a fine it can have devastating consequences on a, on a person right because we don't have the tools yet to assess what does it do to your to your mind if if something like that happens to you and then also the the professionals that in real life are used to help you with that don't know yet they haven't been trained how to help you with an with an event like this so i think it has uh, deep implications. I would also say, though, that these same haptic experiences have been used. I think it's a team in Japan that already has uh, offered it for people who are mourning or in their culture love to reconnect with um, with their relatives from the past. So I think there are whole new opportunities there to do good, too. But again, it, it matters how. So uh, also preserving, you know, legacy within the family and, and uh, when you when you know that someone will pass if they're, they're having a, a chronic illness i mean there are startups who are working on how to deploy these things in a mindful and, and good way but like our audience mentioned we have to make sure that it doesn't uh, turn into uh, exposure towards malicious uh, characters that want to take advantage of these yeah. so ingrid in terms of businesses out there you know, they have, they have business models that they operate towards. They've, they've been trying to do digital transformation. And, and yet here comes another new space for them. So what are the implications for businesses in terms of how they think about their business models? Uh, and importantly, how to get ready for this? You're so right. So I know we're all passionate about digital transformation. So some barely had gotten it into their head that they now have to uh, embark on digital transformation with the traditional models. And now they have yet another tsunami of, of new things they have to deal with. So I, I think the, the message we have is the same. Uh, they need to have a very thorough feasibility analysis of what is suitable for their business to not just mind, you know, mindlessly adopt what someone else did. I, I don't think that's the right approach. So careful feasibility analysis of what is meaningful for their unique case. The second one is they need a clear strategy. They need to think about interoperability way before, and they need to understand how this, the new revenue models play into, into their business currently to re shape their enterprise strategy to accommodate all these new streams, not only of income, but also of interacting with their consumers. So I would say the big things are feasibility analysis, a digital strategy that is encompassing, being very flexible and nimble because they'll need to pivot quite a lot. So I think the competitive threats in this market will be even heightened compared to before uh, due to all this convergence of, of technologies. And last but not least, we already touched on it. I, I think it's essential for them to have, um, in addition to all the traditional things in digital transformation, they need to also uh, be mindful of the unique cyber threats and, and ethical threats. Um, KPIs are also important. No one knows yet what is a KPI for metaverse and omniverse. So yeah. we can do it right this time to think about it from the beginning when we deploy these, how can we monitor appropriately and, and long term as well because as we know we've deployed many technologies before and then no one knows are they having an impact or not same thing like with sustainability so lessons learned from the past if we actually learn from them and deploy it right now we can do it uh, much better so um, i think businesses should learn to not just buy the next technology to not fall into the same trap they're thinking that transforming your business for the metaverse or omniverse is just paying another bill for a new technology. It has to truly transform your human resources, the way you train your staff, the way you retain talent, the way you, you uh, engage them in this current new ecosystem. It has to involve the way you uh, think about pivoting your business model. It has to involve your revenue streams, your marketing strategy. All the facets have to be changed. And I, I, I'm also intrigued, Ingrid, you know, I suppose we're coming through a period of time when we've been talking about really transforming in the form of maybe digitizing, digitalization um, for really a, a physical reality, digitizing, digitalization, what is a physical reality, but now we're talking about really transforming for a virtual 
reality. And, and sometimes I worry that we're going to, like, like when uh, people first designed the first motor cars, they looked like carriages, uh, I don't know, yeah. that horses would, would pull. And I, I have a feeling that in a way, just bringing the way we already do it and bring it to a new level may not be enough here. You know, I think there's a different way of thinking, a uh, completely different way. And I think the only way organizations can really get in tune with this is to be in that space. And whether that's even looking at how gaming, gaming industry, industry 4.0, uh, some of these leading spaces where we're probably seeing early sides of metaverse, I have a feeling they have to really start to get into those spaces and see that it's a different mindset, really. I totally agree. You're so right. Uh, like Ford always said, if they had asked him uh, what people wanted, what consumers wanted, it was uh, sick, more horses, not a new car, right? But uh, in this case, yes, I, I think it's the eternal message we have. They need businesses need to embrace uh, exponential thinking in this case. They need to have an abundance mindset that they'll have to involve multiple disciplines. I think we're going to see even more blurring of industries. It used to be that if you were a tech company, you had to deal with technology. Well, now everybody is a tech company in this era, right? You can't just separate it anymore. And I think same thing we'll see. Um, FinTech is going to be infused now in every other industry because you need to be amenable to function in this new ecosystem where, uh, like we just mentioned, uh, there will be a whole new way of consumers to, to be involved in neo banking and mobile payments than, than before. So we'll see a blurring of industries, a complete reshaping and reconfiguring of, of the way businesses need to, to think about it. And yes, there are industries who've been already at the forefront, so they'll have some competitive edge. There's no doubt that the, the businesses that are learning quick from others and are willing to disrupt themselves are gonna be probably the leaders. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic insight. And you know, and I know we're, we're sort of drawing to a close here as well, Ingrid, but a, a fantastic point really to start to, uh, to uh, finish on. Um, Ingrid, just before I, I go back to Tony, uh, where, where can people find out more about you? I, I know where, where I find out what you're doing, but maybe for others that may be less familiar with your work, where, where can they find uh, you and what you do? Sure. Thank you for that opportunity. Uh, uh, well, I'm on all social media channels, but LinkedIn is probably the easiest one. And um, we have several websites, but the one that I encourage you to check out is um, www.institutesay.org. That's a think tank as well. And we you know, promote all latest trends in science and technology and business. Um, and also please feel free to reach out to me to any media channel. I'm happy to take any questions. And again, thank you both for inviting me. It's, it's been a pleasure. I think we touched on so many things. We need a series for the metaverse and omniverse. Well, there's I, so many things. I have one more challenge for you, Ingrid. I mean, yes. one of the companies you're involved in are uh, Rev Expo Consulting. So yeah. you guys have created a, a metaverse experience for businesses so they can start to understand it. Is there, is there a potential that we could get together in, in that experience and maybe showcase it to our participants? Sure, yes. We've had tremendous um, requests from businesses to help them be in the um, metaverse and build their presence there. So I can uh, connect you. Actually, if you want, you can have a session with uh, our vice president, uh, Mr. John Gomez, who, who can talk to businesses about how to actually physically build their space and have their presence in the in the metaverse so that they can start interacting with consumers. Well, I'm happy to Thank facilitate. You. Thank you. So, so Tony, a future event in this series should be in the metaverse or in the, you know, and, and no, see what absolutely. it means. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think so, Polly. I think, I, I think, great. and thank you for that. Yeah, we would love to. I think, I think it would be, it would be great experience for us, but it'd be great experience for our audience in terms of, well, let's get it, let's make this real because it, it's kind of, well, it's out there somewhere, but how do we make it real and how do, how do we get our arms around it? So I think that would be wonderful. Absolutely. And I can't wait to see both of your avatars because you're going to talk as avatars and yeah. uh, you'll see it's very different. Even the way you interact, right? The, already just in Zoom, it's very different to wait for the next person to talk. But you see there's a tiny delay in the virtual uh, space as well. So getting used to that is, is uh, also interesting. But definitely businesses are going to enjoy seeing 
what does it look like if you have a presence there? How can you market your services? How can you interact? We haven't even touched on arts and culture, but I hope next time you get a chance to do because we've seen already arts galleries, rock concerts, cool. uh, all kinds of things built in the metaverse. So I encourage everybody to check them out. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're just coming up to time, guys. So I'm going to hand over to Tony. I know uh, you've, uh, again, been thinking about where this series can go. Ingrid has given us ideas now about future uh, events, if you want to tell our audience just about, and we'll finish off maybe on that point then. Yeah, well, Ingrid, so thank you. Absolutely fantastic. And you can see see by the level of questions coming through that, you know, you had an audience that was really interested in what you had to say. Look, th this series is around looking at disruptive technologies, understanding you know how does that impact on businesses their business models how does it fit in with digital transformation how do we need to change our mindset our culture our skills and how do we make it happen so but look in terms of today ingrid absolutely fantastic thank you so much thank you thank you yeah. for inviting have a beautiful and that's it and thanks ingrid and thanks also to, to the digital transformation lab committee and cork university business school for again supporting us being able to uh, i suppose have the time to run these events ingrid Thank you so much. A fantastic session. Thank you. Have a nice day. Stay safe, everyone.